uh, and I began this level of work back in the 60s, 1960s, when I was doing uh, research for NASA and uh, had an opportunity to meet a lot of pilots. And so it's an important area and I continue to collect data. I have over 3,000 cases now, very good cases. But I'm trying to specialize in electromagnetic effects. Uh, some transient change in uh, flight director, uh, altimeter, compass, uh, VORs, onboard electronic systems that only change their behavior when there is the presence of some strange phenomenon near the airplane. Is this something that has stemmed from a result of actually analyzing the data and looking for specific patterns? Partly. Uh, as a psychologist, I'm very concerned with the entire testimony. And what that means is not just the words that are used, but the presentation of those words, nonverbal communications, uh, the uh, engineering aspects, uh, what the pilots tell me. So I've had to study a lot about aerona aeronautical systems, uh, aeronautics in general, so that I can put it in context and try to draw conclusions not just from the patterns, which are important, but from specific details. Yeah. Your background um, as somebody who began this interest working with NASA, uh, what were you actually doing with the space agency at that time, back in the early 60s? I was uh, directing a laboratory called the High Luminance Vision Laboratory, which was basically a space simulation. And I could simulate the way objects look to the astronauts in outer space. And this was done for rendezvous and docking purposes for Gemini, Project yeah. Gemini. And uh, during that research, I came to discover that I could set up an optical situation in my laboratory. It was a clean room, before there were clean rooms. And there was a solar simulator uh, for realistic sunlight as it exists in space. And I could set up a target situation that could totally fool the observer. And I was surprised at that. I didn't expect that that could happen. But by controlling the optical variables, I discovered that I could fool you. I could make you see anything I wanted you to see practically. I could change shape, color, size, uh, intensity, um, orientation, distance. And so I said to myself, I can explain UFOs. They're just misidentified natural phenomena. And I think as a skeptic, I set out to disprove the whole thing. Well, it wasn't very long before I found out that I was wrong. I couldn't explain everything that way. Yeah. And that came as a result of interviewing pilots, a lot of them. Were these, in the main, military pilots? Um, or was it just a, a general mix at that time? General mix. I think there were more commercial pilots, actually. Mm. Because uh, we were testing volunteer commercial pilots in our flight uh, research in simulators. Yeah. But was there one specific incident that you can recall that set you on this trail, if you like, of making damn sure that when the opportunity arises, you can have a quick word with those pilots, and then if, if necessary, if, if the pilot's conducive to your line of questioning, um, do, do, do a lengthier study on, on a particular incident and, and the like. Yeah, well, Was the one thing that stuck out? I wish I could say yes, but my conversion was slow and gradual mm. because I'm a s skeptical kind of a stubborn person. Yeah. And I had to let the data speak for itself, and the data came in in bits and pieces. Mm. So it isn't any one case, uh, although there are many spectacular single cases that I've looked at. It's the constellation. It's the message that is embedded in, in many, many high quality cases from pilots. Mm. As I fly commercial around the world, I try to make it a point to talk with the flight crew, both the flight attendants in the back and the flight crew up front. And I must say that I'm getting about 15 to 20 percent. Really? Roughly one out of five people I talk with uh, say yes, they've had a, a strange sighting. That doesn't mean that it's a, quote, traditional UFO, but it's something they couldn't identify. Yeah. And with their experience, that's a significant, you see. I will share one that took place over Lake Michigan on an L-1011 filled with passengers on July 4th, 
1979, I think it was. I don't remember the year, very frankly, because I have so many. It's yeah. hard to remember them. But they're on autopilot at cruise altitude, cruise speed. Uh, the sun is above them uh, and slightly behind them. And uh, the captain told me, face to face, sitting in the cockpit of this airplane later on when we reconstructed the, the whole event, that he was sitting back in his seat with his hands behind his head, just, you know, nobody's flying the airplane, it's flying itself. Sure. His co-pilot is turned in his seat looking behind him to the flight engineer talking about something. And the sky is blue and no cloud up ahead. Well, Captain Schultz told me that suddenly something caught his attention out to the left about 30 degrees of straight ahead and 30 degrees above the horizon. And so he concentrated on it, and he said it appeared very quickly full size. It did not appear as a point and enlarge. That's important. He said it was as if the object had broken through the atmosphere, because as it appeared full size, little radiating lines seemed to appear, like stress cracks. He took a paper napkin that he had in the cockpit, and held, he had me hold two corners, and he held two corners, and he pushed his thumb through the middle, like he was demonstrating this effect. Well, he said, what's that? He thought he'd have a mid-air collision. He was quite concerned. His first officer turned in his seat and could see it. I talked to both of them and got the same story. The object was silvery, reflected sunlight, the way polished metal would. Came down in altitude to his altitude, did a high-speed turn. I calculated about 30 Gs, roughly and about a thousand miles an hour towards him, about a thousand miles an hour going away in a climb, which is significant. And as it's leaving, it leaves a, a wispy, dark smoke trail behind it. Not, he didn't see it coming. He said that he immediately radioed the Milwaukee his center, flight traffic control, and said, do you have any other traffic up here with us? And they checked their radar and said, no, we have nobody up here. And he didn't report it, obviously. I met a Soviet fighter pilot who'd retired by the time I met him. This was approximately 1995, 94 that I met him. And he came to Novosibirsk, where I was lecturing at the university there, uh, to meet me from Chelyabinsk. And he, because he had this story to tell, and he couldn't find anyone to tell it to. And so I'd been there from America, and so he came over. Well, he was in a Czechoslovak two-place trainer, but he was alone in the cockpit, doing acrobatic training. It was a clear, sunny day, very cold, as you might imagine, uh, in the Ural region. Well, he was doing acrobatic loops, vertical loops. And as he would come over the top and start down the other side, he was generally in the northerly direction. And the city of Chelyabinsk, which is about one and a half million people, was to the north of him. And he said on three, I think three of these loops, and he got, as he got to the top of this loop and looked almost level now in the northerly direction, here was a very long grayish cigar just hovering out there in front of him. Well, he was flabbergasted. I mean, he was shocked. This is, he doesn't work a spe a, a speak a word of English. Uh, and so it was all in Russian. And he said to me that it didn't move, as far as he could tell. There was no background to compare, actually. But it, he was surprised it was above the city because there was a lot of air defense at that time. This was before Perestroika. And he did three of these loops, and each time it was in the same place, and he radioed the field where he had taken off from, which was to the south and east of the city quite a ways. Do you have anything on radar? And they checked, nothing on radar. So they, they, they said, come back and land. Don't stay up there. He was, had no weapons on board the plane. It was just a training flight. So he did. He immediately went back. As he's getting ready to land, which would, must have been 10 minutes later, approximately, he happens to touch his face. He's wearing a leather flight helmet, no goggles, so it's unexposed around his eyes, and an oxygen mask. He gave me the oxygen mask as a souvenir. He said, 
I happened to touch my eye region and my nose uh, at above the, where it was protected, and I couldn't feel anything. I was anesthetized. And he used the Russian word for cork. He said my skin felt hard and puffy, and I had no sensation there, like cork. So he landed. He's getting a little concerned, right? Went right, to, got out of the airplane, went right to the dispensary, to the doctor. The doctor uh, examined him and said, you have some sort of burns, skin burns. Come back and see me in a day if they don't repair. Well, he said for about two and a half to three weeks, the, his skin right in this open region here puffed out, he said, about a half an inch. Well, I talked to his wife when I was visiting years later in Chelyabinsk, and she backed up the story. She used her own words, but it, it backed up the story. She was scared. Some sort of radiation she was concerned about. And eventually, after two, three weeks, it goes back to normal, and there's nothing remaining, by the way, today. He was very concerned, as you might imagine. And I said, would you be willing to let me hypnotize you? And this is only the second time I've had a pilot agree. And so I'm, in Russian, would you believe, I hypnotized this Russian pilot, the Soviet pilot, and he comes out with more details under hypnosis, which tells me that it's a valid technique, uh, and I can't bias him in any significant way because I don't know that cockpit that well. Later on, I studied the cockpit and the flight performance of the aircraft, and I can tell you the wavelength transmission of the windows because I'm concerned of how many seconds he was exposed, assuming it was from that object. Uh, what is the radiation dose falling on the skin that would produce that level of, of effect, even though we don't know what it is? It was edema. It was a water buildup, but we don't understand the hardness, uh, the cork effect, let's call it. Mm. Um, it was a very interesting case from the yeah. Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, one case comes to mind, uh, a pilot and three passengers, two of whom were pilots themselves, were flying from southern Florida up to uh, North Carolina at night in a, a twin-engine propeller plane. And Willie Smith did the analysis with Dr. Hynek years ago. He, the, the two of them interviewed the pilot. Well, they had electromagnetic problems with their VOR, which is part of the, the in-flight navigation system, such that it was drifting them farther and farther out to sea. They were over the Atlantic Ocean at the time. They were about 10 miles off the coast of Florida. And they could keep the land in sight, but there was not much traffic, and it was the air was as reasonable and so forth, smooth. Well, that's the first part of the story, that they're drifting more and more. So air traffic control, I think in Atlanta, calls them and says, where are you going? Correct your flight path 10 degrees left, you know, get back to land, so to speak, because you're drifting further and further. And they check their VOR um, and find that it's correct that is reading correctly, even though the radar from the ground tells them they're in the wrong place, more and more. Well, this happens twice. They have two corrections in flight uh, over about a 40-minute period. Well, at one point, off to the east of them in the dark night sky, they see a light coming towards them, and it's fairly fast, it's fairly bright. They think it's an airplane. So he flashes his, his, his landing lights, which is standard operating procedure, right? Just to signal they see you, because you don't want to have any collision, of course. The object comes towards them on a, uh, a bearing about 40 degrees, about the 2 o'clock position, roughly, relative to their heading. Uh, comes down to their altitude, and the witnesses claim that this was a triangle, an equilateral triangle, whose sides were vertical, if you can think of that. So it isn't a thin triangle, it's a thick triangle, about six stories high, what's that, 60 feet, 70 feet thick, and at least, I forget that the estimate was hundreds of feet side to side to side on the three sides, and a triangular opening in the middle. And the pilot said it was such a huge opening that he was contemplating flying through the middle of this thing to avoid it. The object comes to an instantaneous stop at some unknown distance, where they don't know how far away it was, and reverses 180 degrees and goes off as it has come at a high speed until it's out of sight. Well, 
As interesting as that case is, that's a non-aerodynamic vehicle as far as I'm concerned. It's not ball lightning. It's not birds. It's not a balloon for lots of reasons. It's not stealth technology, because you'd never build anything but stealth that way. We don't know its, its propulsion. It did not produce a shock wave. In that case, there were no electromagnetic effects as it was near the airplane. Perhaps the earlier effects, we don't know. It had very bright, round lights, uh, like headlights, along this 60-foot high front facing it. It flew front forward, by the way, not point forward. Each of these round lights were estimated to be six feet in diameter and white. So you can calculate the, the megawatts that are required to light those searchlights up, whatever they are. And by the way, I don't think they're portholes and I don't think they're lights. I think they're a direct artifact of the propulsion system.